Hey everybody, welcome to Breakfast with Bob from Clash Miami. My name is Bob Babbitt, brought to you by S Fuels, Hoka, Master Spas, DeBoer, Wetsuits, Premium Plus Sports, and of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation, our next guest from France, Mr. Leon Chevalier. How you doing, Leon? Bonjour, Bob. I'm doing well. Thank Bonjour. you. Bonjour. You don't sound that French to me. Bonjour. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> yeah. You've got the pain au chocolat. But seeing how fast you run, you know, Cozumel 242, Nice 239, 246 in South Africa, I'm assuming that high school, college, you were uh, an elite runner? Um, yeah, I've always been running, uh, walking to school, not yeah. as far as the Kenyans do. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just running my whole life, uh, being outdoorsy. Um, I guess I started like athletics when I was 12, I think, yes. and um, kind of quickly shifted into triathlon because... I had friends doing it, and also um, I was actually pretty good on a bike, and uh, yeah, immediately was pretty good at it, and uh, kind of never really looked at anything else after that. What's fascinating to me is when they announced the Olympics was going to be in London, all of a sudden there was a huge infusion of capital into making sure, if we're inviting people to a party at our place, we'll make sure we win some medals. So all of a sudden, here come the Brownlee brothers, and you know, the, the UK triathlon world just boomed, same on the parasite a number of years later. Uh, now the, the Olympics are going to be in Paris, and you're seeing a huge group of, of great French, not just in the Olympic distance, but yourself, Sam Laidlaw, so many others. Yeah, the, the French system for triathlon is kind of, like it's kind of a bit of a mainstream sport in the sense that you can sign up to your local triathlon club like you'd sign up for football or basketball yeah. or rugby. And so uh, a lot of young kids are just given this option and uh, they try it out. And then there's so many races. You've, got, you've usually got the regional and national champs for duathlon, triathlon, and aquathlon. So that's yes. pretty much six high-level races that you get from age about 12 to 18. Every year you get that level of racing. And you've got you know, over 100 young people per category um, doing it and right. so you've just got this massive pool of talent um, and obviously then the best get you know um, chosen by the federation to start doing the international racing and all of that and year after year it's more and more athletes and um, yeah a couple of years ago Sam Laylo and I kind of moved up I guess to the the full distance yes and all these other guys that we were racing when we were younger probably looked at it and were like if they can do it we can probably do it too, and um, <laughs> and now here we are. Like I don't know, it's like five guys I think on the yeah on the men's side, five French guys. Uh, we've got Marjolaine on the on the women's side too, yes. and uh, I'm assuming uh, more in the years to come. So when I look at uh, the Ironman World Championships in Nice, having the World Championships in your home country, Sam wins it, uh, you get fifth. I mean, you you guys did really really well. How exciting was it to run in front of the home crowd? Uh, yeah, it was amazing. I think the fact that it was so close to home just meant to, that, I, I mean, I think I had about 15 members of my family, extended family, friends came over just because the logistics. Because they of could. It, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was so close. So um, they were there on the Promenade des Anglais and it was, yeah, an amazing atmosphere. I just loved it and got to see everyone. And also just in terms of the preparation for the race, it was, I just, I was out in the mountains, you know, we had our interview yes. online and uh yeah, it was just easy. I had my dog with me over there. It just like felt really normal. And then it's the biggest race of the year. And, uh, and you can still have a croissant at the finish line. Obviously, you want to win in your home country. But seeing Sam win, right? And you passed each other numerous times. So you, you saw that the guy was going to win. How did that make you feel? Yeah, obviously, I, <laughs> I do want to win. Um, I think Sam's a couple years ahead of me in the sense that he, you know, he's been committed to this Ironman journey for so many more years than I have. And uh, yeah, he's finally cracked it. Uh, it's, yeah, obviously I want, I want it to, yes. but at the same time, you're like, he can do it and I like- <laughs> You can taste I, it. I can do it too, yeah. <laughs> and you're I, right there. I wasn't that far, but I know also the gap is, you know, obviously the faster it goes, the right. harder it is to, to um, bridge that gap. But yeah, it just shows that, you know, you want it, you can pursue it. And uh, it's nice to have a turnover in the people who, who are winning. I guess Patrick was still on the podium, but you look at that top 10, it's pretty much brand new people. Brand new people. Yeah. Well, and especially, I think, after this next Olympics, we're going to see a lot of folks going, oh, there's a lot of money in this, these PTO T100 races. 
Yeah, there's a, a lot of money in the longer course, but I also think there's the, um, the ability to choose your own race program. Um, the fact that if you're good enough, then your ranking's going to be up there and you're going to be selected. Right. There's no cap on nationalities or anything, whereas the Olympics, it's very much, you either have to be like top two in your country and you could be the fourth best in your country, but if your country's the best in the world, you don't have that spot. I so know. you've got... There's a lot of challenges with that, and you have to comply with all these federation rules and everything. Whereas here, it's like, you know what? Um, I want to do this race. I'm going to prepare for it. I'm going to be good enough, and so I'm going to qualify, and then I'm going to be on the series, and then yes. I've got these sponsors that I want to work with, and they want to work with me, and y you're your own boss, and uh, it's got its own risk, obviously. But, but you're not dealing with the politics. You're not dealing with, you have to wear this kit. The logo has to be this size. Yeah, there's so much crap that you have to deal with when it comes to dealing with federations. And also, a lot of times they're not funding you to get to different races. <laughs> That's it. I think it was Joe Skipper posted something in his story. He was like, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, federations get to meddle with this. But um, there's no, yeah, as you said, no funding. It's they don't only help. just like the constraints of having it rather right. than the help. But. Yeah, we'll see how it goes in the next few years. So when you look at, we were just before we started chatting, I'm, you know, I'm looking at uh, obviously Nice, things like that, and I was, I was seeing how fast you're running. You were mentioning that you just ran a 106 half marathon? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was off the back of my Nice preparation after the World Champs, I took like a full month off. Yeah. Then I got back home, did uh, two weeks of running around the track, and uh, did that half marathon. It was just down the road from where I live, and... Uh, yeah, we had really good conditions, but it's not the fastest of courses. And um, I lost, there's a hill at the very end that it, it knocked two seconds off my average pace. Uh, but I took a lot of confidence from that run. Absolutely. You know you do, 20K at like 307 per K. And it's like, <laughs> that's fast. And all of a sudden I was like, wait, that's my threshold? And when yeah. I'm running around the track, like half marathon pace is like just ludicrous speed. And I, yeah, just like shifted something yes. in like my perspective. And um yeah, I guess uh, it means I can run fast. As somebody who's been running for a long time, how, how much of a difference have the plated shoes made? Uh, I don't actually, I use them obviously in racing. Right. Um, I don't really tend to train in them. They have definitely made a difference. Right. Like you see the speeds that people are running at and when you put them on, I mean, it's mostly the foam that you, you feel. And right. Like it's kind of with these, um, so I, I race in the Rocket X2s from yes. Hoka. And yes. It's kind of like sometimes if you're fatigued, you can just like chuck your foot in front of you and let the shoe do the work. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas if you did, I used to race in these like racing flats, like a pancake you thin. You feel you know, every pebble. And you wanted it to be like as light as possible. I feel the ground. Yeah, it's like wearing a glove. And now we've got these shoes that are like super thick and it's, it's very different. Um, we've seen Lionel now, he's like, no more carbons. Um, <laughs> And it's like, he, he does have a point there because um, your foot actually does so much work. Um, I run a lot on the trails right. and, you know, you're doing like five kilometers an hour going uphill um, yeah. in the mud. But that's where like all the little muscles in your toes and everything yes. are working. And with the carbon shoes, you don't really need that anymore. So I think it's good to have the mix and, well, you definitely feel the boost on race day. I love it. Hey, and then we're uh, in last year, 2022, Ironman Vittoria Gastiez. Is that how it's pronounced? Is that pretty close? 257 marathon. I'm like, what the hell? Uh, that's, that's not you. Yeah, so that was um, a weird race for me. Um, it was off the back of um, my first Ironman World Champs in St. George, where I'd come six. Yep. And so I go into this race, um, I'd won... Ironman Mallorca like the previous October and it's the first time I was coming to like a big race with a bit of pressure I guess or like at least from my side you know yes. it was the first time I was expectations expectations I was being put up um, at the hotel by Ironman and press conferences and it was like very different for me and also it was the first one where I was like I should be winning this race and so I did like a really good prep um but it was in the start of the summer and a heat wave and I was doing these turbo sessions in extreme heat. And I think I just kind of like cooked myself a yes. bit. Yeah. And on race day, I just like didn't quite have that punch in the swim. And so I was just a bit back um, out of the water and I get to my bike and one of the tires was oh. flat. <laughs> um, I think like the inner tube failed on that day and... Uh, 
yeah, it was um, then like 10 minutes basically of sorting it out. And by the time I set off on the bike, literally, yeah, the start of the bike out of transition, I'm 15 minutes down. And when you start, you still got seven hours ahead of you and <laughs> you're definitely not in the race. You're not going to get back into the race because the guys in the group are moving so fast and everything. But I just kept at it. It was like such a long day. And the marathon I had, a, you know, halfway through, I was like, this is just such a slog. But then I, I think I got caught by the lead age group woman <laughs> on the run. <laughs> she, so wait, she was a lap down. She oh, was allowed okay, to okay, okay. But she came up to me and uh, she was running. I was like, you know what? She's like racing and like, sh I'm sure she needs some company. So I'll run with her for a yes. bit. Because I'd been walking for like a couple of minutes at that yeah, point. Yeah. And I kind of got my mojo back then and kept on running, kept running. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I think I got eighth or ninth place. You and right, um, yeah. I got some prize money it paid for my trip there. And uh, the whole atmosphere around the trip was really nice. You know, I was there with my partner, Flory, and we were eating tapas and like going out for pizza and everything. It was really, really enjoyable. But the race, I guess, yeah, it taught me to not give up. And I've not DNF'd a race yet. And um, It's important because it's once you start. I think it's a slippery slope. It really and, is. Um, that day, yeah. And I, I actually got a lot of, um, yeah, people being like proud of or like saying like that's a great thing that you just did. And I exactly. was obviously really proud of it. And um, You should be. Because yeah. it's easy. I mean, reality is in your mind you can be thinking, Okay, I, running a marathon right now, I'm, if, I, if I cut the cord right now, I can go race somewhere else next weekend. You, you sort of you cut your losses and you move on. Or it's, you know, it is important for me to finish what I start because it's a message not only for me, but for that kid watching back home. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, as you said, finish what you start. Um, I'm actually like, it's almost a bit problematic with me. I struggle to let go of something that I start up, but I think it's really important when you commit. And I think you're talking about my consistency and so consistent. You know, I've yeah. got three top sevens at world champs over the last three years. And yep. um, that's because early on I commit to that race and I'll see it through no matter what. And um, yeah, it, it's, it also means that, you know, you've got your plan and like for this race, I'd plan to do the race, have a week off on the beach with family after that. And you know, if you don't finish the race, like, how do you get to enjoy that holiday? <laughs> you so really don't. It was like, I plan to do it. I'll do it. I'll be a bit slower than if I'd been at the front of the race, but still do it. And then, you know, enjoyed a, a week of holiday. And after that, I went off to Alpe d'Huez. And I you won. I won by like 20 minutes, which was because I was in really good shape. And I just wanted like a bit of a revenge, I yes. guess. And uh, yeah, that got me onto the right path. I then like podium at another 70.3, got seventh in Kona. So, um, yeah, there's, I guess there's a lesson in every race. So, Optuez, for people who don't know much about Optuez, you are climbing Optuez and then running at the top. Yeah, and there's, um, I think, two or three long climbs before you get to Optuez. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a proper, like, mountain stage from the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's mountain passes that they actually do um, in, in the Tour de France. And... Uh, it's a really tough race, um, but it's amazing if you if you like cycling, if you like the views, and um, it's so well organized. Um, it's an independent organization, yes. and uh, they do such a good job of it. And it's just like a really special place to race, and now they've changed the run course, so um, you're at 1,800 meters um, elevation. I, I don't know in feet, that's probably it's like close to like high. five and a half yeah, thousand, yeah, yeah. something like that. And um, you have to run down this, um, airport runway which is actually like this really <laughs> steep that you, it's like throwing yourself off the edge of a cliff and you just run down it and you do it three times once per lap and uh yeah it's a really tough course but i think of all the races um in the world is probably the one that suits me the best um the running uh yeah i'm good at it yes like off-road and like just little steps left, right. And a little and bit of climbing on a bike. A little bit of climbing on the bike and a bit of the, that technical aspect. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really special race. And um, I kind of have this vision where like the PTO do one of their pro races. There. <sighs> How fun would that be? That would be amazing. So does this course suit you? It's, it's obviously pancake flat. There's <laughs> a little road course stuff going on. Uh, it'll be hot, obviously, um, middle of the afternoon. So does this suit you? Um, you know what, so we're talking about this climbing and I thought that's what suited me, but then 
you know, I did well I, Kona. I go yeah, yeah. Kona, I've got the third fastest bike split ever, a second off Cam's um, time, and uh, I had to stop for a, a minute penalty. 409? You had yeah. a penalty? Yeah, I'd like dropped a bottle or something oh my like God, that. Okay. So it felt a bit, bit unfair, but you can't change it. Right. And um, in the end, that was a really good bike split. I went under four hours in Cozumel, which is... Uh, I was quite proud of that. There was no swim. I know. Yeah, but, but you're just starting on a bike, which sometimes is harder. It was like such a weird start. It was literally, they were... Um, go. We were on the start <laughs> line in our swim stuff yeah. and everything, ready to go in the water. But then the pontoon got detached and it was all a bit chaotic. And they got us back in the buses to the to the bike start. And they got all a set of pros together. And they were like, this is how we're going to do it, 15 seconds apart. And I kind of asked them, when do we start? It's now. Like, he was like, yeah, in three at 45. And I was like, what time is it now? He said, like, it's 42. <laughs> it's and three minutes you're I gonna was go. the first guy to have to go. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? So, like, you get this adrenaline rush. And then you just, like, go through the motions. You get on the bike. You absolutely hammer it. I had Sebi Keenly uh, just behind me. And we did most of the bike. Um, yeah, well, he, he sat behind me most yeah, of the bike. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, 358. 358, basically time trialing. Yeah, and I mean, but time trialing from no swim where you loosen up a little bit, you're basically. And it was it was really hot that day, really humid. Yep. Um, but you don't get any warm up. It's like you jump on the bike and you, you just do what you got to do. And um, it was really good. It kind of you know opened my eyes to what I could do. Obviously, still on the bike. Exactly. And so I think a flat course also suits me. Um, and obviously in the heat, I've, I've actually done all right. You've um, done very well in the heat. So we'll see on Saturday. When you do Cozumel and you, you do that, basically high intensity, 258 bike and then 242, you, you can just tell people, you know, when people say, what's your Ironman PR? 642. <laughs> you don't have to tell them there's no swim. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> I tell yeah. people all the time, when people say, well, you did Ironman. I said, yeah, I, I did it in 1980. And they go, well, what did you finish? I said, 58th. You were top 60? I don't tell them there was only 108 of us in the race. <laughs> you know, you, don't, wanna, you yeah. don't tell them there was no swim. You're fine with that. What yeah. the hell? What um, is what it is. It was the same for everyone. So. Exactly. So when you go to Kona, was that your first time, Kona? Yeah, first yeah. time in Kona, yeah. And you, you run 249, you go 755 first time out. You got to come away from that going, okay, we're going back to Kona this year. This course is me. This course suits me. Yeah, I, the, there's definitely a lot of time that I've left out there. You know, that 749, I think I've now, um, you know, going 739 in, in Nice, that yes. was for me a big step because I'd kind of been stuck around that 746 time. Yep. Like I'd done that two, three times and... Uh, yeah, my running's definitely improved a lot. I joined my ro my local running club last year, and uh, just being at the track a couple times a week with everyone, you know, everyone's got, their, everyone's got their normal jobs at the, right. during the day, and everyone comes out in the evening, and we just like rip our legs off each other. I and, love um, it. Yeah, it's been really, really nice. Um, and I think going back to Kona after that bike split too in Cozumel, I just feel like there's at least 10, if not 15 minutes out there in Kona. And I think if you start doing those times, like low 740s. You think you can go sub, uh, you can, <clears throat> someone's going to go sub four there in Kona on the bike. Yeah, I think we need the right conditions. Yeah. Uh, I think we did have good conditions in 2022, yes. but it, it's coming. Um, yeah, you, you know, Sam, he rode away from Magnus. Yes. And... Well, Magnus had that penalty too. That was a problem. Yeah, but that was at the very end. Yes. He'd like, so, and everyone knows now that Sam's capable, that Magnus is capable. Cam's always going <laughs> to be in there. And, um, and obviously you're there. Yeah, I guess I kind of fly under yeah, the radar, then, I guess. Uh, you don't but, fly under the radar anymore. Um, but yeah, and my swim's improving too. Um, yes. I'm getting back to, to levels that I'm a bit happier with. Um, yeah. I'm seeing improvement in, in training and... I Love guess it. that's what you want. It's so, awesome. Uh, improvement. You're getting better. That's when you yeah. start running a 106 straight half marathon. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like it. to do it off the bike now. <laughs> yeah, you will. There's no question about that. Leon, thank you so much for taking time. It was really, really a pleasure. I can't wait to see you here and then watch you again in Kona. Thanks, Bob. I'll see you there. And now any other, will Kona be your only Ironman? Or do you have to go qualify somewhere? No, I'm qualified from Cozumel. Okay, perfect. So that's ticked off. It will not be my only long distance race of the year but you're not going to announce it yet not yet challenge roth go for that could be good can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> leon chevalier has been our guest that was a no comment i think again this is breakfast with bob my name is bob babbitt we're at clash miami hold on everybody we will be right back <laughs>